Welcome, everyone. Let's talk about time symmetry. So today we're talking about time symmetry. And here's some interesting stuff that you might not have thought about. Why do we care about time symmetry, right? Everybody knows some things about time symmetry, right? Like, for instance, we could have, um, we could have things that look the same if you play them backwards. Uh, as the same thing as they look when we play them forwards, or we can have things that look different. Like periodic things look the same forward and backwards, right? Like, so this is a pendulum. So if I were to swing it like this, and we were to let this go through a couple seconds, and then we were to play the footage backwards, it would look the same, right? Except maybe my mouth moving would look differently. But just the pendulum itself, the motion of the pendulum, would look the same. Now, what about other things? Say, like, I don't know, like this. If I were to take this and drop it. Now we play that backwards. It's not gonna look the same, right? It's gonna, it'll be weird, right? It will come back up and then into my hand and I'd be holding it. If you let it rotate a full two pi, it would still look the same. Yeah, okay, yes. If I let it rotate a full two pi, it would still look the same. If you don't, then it won't, yes. Um, but you get the picture. <laughs> now, if you like do something like that where I drop it, then I hold the string up like this and I drop it, gravity takes hold. And if we were to play that film backwards, it would look weird, right? You would see it like kind of come down, bounce, and then go back up into my hand. And I'd be ending like this, which is strange. We have this. Guys, it's gone. Okay? It's never coming back. I'm sorry. It's gone forever. Um, but it'd be strange, right, if you actually saw me do that. <laughs> it'd be strange if you actually saw the ten or the golf ball bounce up to the floor and then come back up into my arms and the whole thing was played forward in time, right? You would find that to be weird. Here's something that's kind of interesting, something that's kind of cool that I don't think many people know. So I'm going to ask chat, I'm going to ask Twitch chat, and you're welcome to answer. Uh, and you're welcome to answer however you so seem fit. Okay? What is an antiparticle? And how does it relate to time symmetry? So you don't have to do the time symmetry part, but just in your opinion, what's an antiparticle? And there's going to be some weird things that people say. Like there's going to be some people that think antiparticles have negative mass. Uh, there's going to be some people that think that they're just also particles with negative charge. There's evil particles. Okay. All right. Evil particles is a good one. How long uh, is the lesson? Because I have a little bit of work to do. Uh, it's your mom, mom particles sister. Oh, auntie particles. <laughs> Come on. You're fired. Justin, you're fired. Come on. Who says auntie particles? The other side of the uh, opposite charge and negative time. Ooh, opposite charge and negative time. Very good, Lobo. Uh, three minute lesson, <laughs> no, 30 minute lesson. <laughs> Antiparticle is evil, they want to take over the world. Good one, the opposite of uncle particles, nice, nice, nice. The exact opposite of particles that would cause it to explode. <laughs> well, annihilate Haney, definitely, but explode, maybe. Lots of energy, I suppose, you still have to have that energy. I guess it depends on what you mean by explode. So let's talk about antiparticles and what they even mean. Here's really why we need antiparticles, right? If I were to have space-time, two-dimensional space-time, x and t, okay? So we're gonna have an x and a t. Now this is gonna require some special relativity at the, for the first part, and then after that it's gonna get a little heavier. Um, same mass, opposite charge, very good. That is exactly what an antiparticle is. Um, so, if we were to have a space-time diagram that kind of looks like this, we have a space, we have a coordinate system with x and t. Now suppose there's a second coordinate system, okay? Don't Hang you have to define what a particle is first? Uh, yeah, well, we're going to assume that that's given, okay? We're going to assume we have particles. What if it has no charge? Then it's usually its own antiparticle. Um, like, a lot of bosons are their own antiparticle. Is that true to say? Justin, am I missing something with that? You can have W and anti-W because you can have charge Ws. Bosons, that is. But I don't think there's a particle that exists that uh, is neutral that also has an antiparticle. I don't think so, at least. Opposite of every quantum number. So photon is a good example because it has un is 
uncharged under all gauge groups. Uh, so the neutrino is actually incredibly complicated, uh, that Russian guy. It's, it's, neutrinos have this, they're still not convinced that neutrinos are not Majorana. Now, a Majorana particle is its own antiparticle. It's a Majorana fermion because it's specific to fermions because there's bosons that are their own antiparticles like photons. Um, but Majorana fermions are their own antiparticle uh, and therefore neutral. Um, but neutrinos, they're only, there's still some speculation about that. That's not guaranteed yet. So if the bosons touched, they would annihilate? Um, I'm not sure the mechanism for annihilation, but yes, you can you annihilate two bosons together for sure. Particles are like unicorns, like gluons. Like a common gluon equation is going to be like, gluons are curly. Like that's that's two annihilating and creating one. Remember, annihilation at a point usually means creation at that point as well. I don't know what annihilation to nothing means. So annihilation at a point is usually creation at a point as well. That's a Feynman diagram for gluons, if anybody was interested. Um, particles are like unicorns. <laughs> anyway, so you have this space-time diagram, right? This, this X versus T diagram. Well, now suppose there's another fr frame of reference, right, that looks like this. Where X prime is now the X prime direction. Actually, let's make it a little less, little, uh, less dramatic. Like that there we go now I have X prime and then T prime now really the only rule so if you haven't done special relativity really the only rules in this are that your T prime your frame of reference for T is gonna be greater than one a slope of one and X prime would be less than a slope of one so if we have the slope of one here which is in this frame of reference the speed of light then your T prime is going to be you know something like this and then your X prime is gonna be something like that. But for now, let's get rid of that slope of one. And so we have our primed frame of reference as an observer in motion, okay? So an observer in motion, let's move this up a little bit. It looks like I'm getting this cut off, huh? There we go. Um, so what happens? Well, let's establish two points in this space-time diagram. So we're gonna have event B here and I'm going to pick these events kind of specifically okay and then we're also going to have event a that happens here and if you're trained in special relativity you might have an idea of what I'm trying to do here but I'm trying to be very dubious with my drawing okay because there's something that's very specific happening so a and b are events so they basically just happen say like you have a particle traveling and it goes from here to here. So the particle traveling through space would go from A to B in your frame of reference, in your stationary frame of reference. Okay? So say we have a particle going from A to B. In the stationary frame of reference, if I were to draw a line from A to time, so it happens at this time, time equals, you know, T1, B would happen at, uh, why did I write X? A happens at T1, and B, B happens at T2. So A happens at T1, B happens at T2, right? But now, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to know how A and B happened in the frame of reference of the observer, I follow somewhat of the same rules, right? I have to apply that this, uh, this, if I want to know what time B happens on T1, I just run parallel to the X prime axis and I can figure out where it intercepts the T prime axis. So let's see, let's run parallel. And it intercepts the T prime axis right here. So here, B happens at T prime one. And then what about A? A happens right here. A little bit later than A happens for this one. What's going on here? Well, the B is happening in this one first. So if you're in the traveling frame of reference, like if I'm, if, if you're the stationary one, if you're in X and T, and you're watching my motion, X prime T motion, and T prime, what's happening is I see B happen before A. Woo. So you see the particle moving this way, but I see the particle moving this way. 
in your frame of reference. I just see something different, right? My B, look at where my B is. My B happens on this part of X. Oops, hold on. Parallel would be like there. And this part of X, right? And A happens at this part of X. And this part of X prime. So while the A's and B's, A's and, you know, the A for both coordinates is roughly around the same spot. It's not exactly in the same spot, but it's roughly around the same spot. And B is roughly around the same spot as well, roughly. But yeah, I watch the particle go from B to A in my motion, and you watch the particle go from A to B. So how do we talk about these particles, right? How do we talk about a particle that in my frame of reference is backwards than your frame of reference? How do we call it backwards? Well, we're talking about causality, right? A then B, that's a causal, that's causal. A then B. So then if I want to talk about the particle as well and I see B then A, then what there's really meaning is I can talk about it in your frame of reference in backwards time, in negative time, okay? And likewise, what ends up happening is the charge switches as well. well so you have Q goes to negative Q uh, for the particle going backwards in time. But this causes some issues. So this is weird in itself, but this is a way to talk about this, the particle that is traveling from A to B in one frame of reference would be to A in the other frame of reference. <clears throat> is this like when you're driving next to a truck and you think like you are moving backwards? Yep, exactly like that. You feel like you're moving backwards. Yep. Mm. Is it? You feel stationary and you feel like the truck is, yes. You feel stationary in that frame of reference and that you feel like the truck is moving. <clears throat> but it's different. It's like if you were in space, right? Where did I put my broken chalk? If you were in space and you're driving a spaceship and you were traveling this way, how do you know you're traveling? If you're in a constant velocity, so you're in a constant velocity V, you're how do you know you're moving? Where there's nothing to, where there's nothing to change, with, you're not moving in reference to anything, right? Because you're in the absolute dead of space. So how do you know that you're moving if there's nothing to compare it to? Well then say there's, an, there's a spaceship going this way, but at a much less velocity, right? So they're moving at V prime but it's a lot slower. Then the only thing that you're gonna see is a spaceship going this way as you overtake him. But that's what we figured out. And I, I mean, there's a lot of relativity that happens that Einstein kept going. I think the biggest thing was relativity of time, which he said was a big issue because this is a big issue, right? And like, this was a big issue in quantum mechanics. So what they had to do was figure out a way to make it work. So this is what we did instead. Especially because quantum mechanics is not relativistic. So there's two types of time reversal symmetry that we're gonna talk about. Time reversal symmetry being like, what does it look like if a particle goes from A to B, uh, and then we reverse time. So we send T to minus T. What does it look like? So go back to the billiard ball example or the, the golf ball dropping, right? So the big thing with the golf ball dropping, which is gone forever, is if I drop the golf ball and it, and it bounces and we see the effects of gravity and then we reverse the footage that we have on VOD now, Welcome to then the what channel. happens is Things we see the ball bounce back weird. up and into my hand. <laughs> Kurov, welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. <laughs> Every time. Um, so the ball <laughs> falls and we can see that, you know, we play the footage backwards. It would just look like a ball went up into my hand, which would be weird, right? We'd be like, that's, that's weird. Unless we knew that we were reversing the footage. So now what happens if we talk about particles going forward? Well, really, if we want to reverse the footage, all we do is we send T to some negative T, right? We say, oh, instead of going from time one to time two, go from time two to time one. Send T to negative T and then we'll figure it out. But, like we found out that if you do that, in this situation, you end up just getting an antiparticle instead. So antiparticles are nice because, hey, like that's a good way to describe how someone in the X frame of reference sees A then B, and then X prime sees B and then A, but they're the same thing, right? But now we have to do something else. We have to make it more logical in the sense of like, say like, what if I want, should I do this? Yeah, let's do it. What if I want an electron to go from A to B? 
And then in this frame of reference, I say, okay, I want to talk about the electron going from B to A. Like just back, backing up. So this is the example that I gave my friend. I said, hey, you have a billiard ball, okay? And you give it, you spin the billiard ball, spin it. And then you push it. So it's spinning and it's traveling along in a direction, right? Then you say, okay, now we're gonna replay time. What do you see? Well, you see a billiard ball spinning the opposite direction and traveling the opposite direction backwards, right? But, yeah, it's a spaceship, John. What do you think? <laughs> it's a nice spaceship, too. But, what do you th what, but what's the difference? Well, that's a billiard ball that's just changing direction and momentum. But it's still the same billiard ball. So now let's say, hey, I want to talk about an electron going from A to B. But when I reverse time, when I reverse the footage and it goes back from B to A, I want it to still be an electron, not a positron. That's true time reversal symmetry. So let's see what happens if we have some, if we play around with some of the mathematics. So for this, I'm following Schwartz. Schwartz has an extra ex excellent uh, prescription of this, if you have Schwartz. Okay, so we need a way to distinguish a particle can go backwards in time, opposite charge, and the same mass. We have that as the electron, but can we have the exact same, or we have that as the antiparticle, but can we actually have that as the same particle? And that's what we're going to set out to do. Um, so time reversal symmetry is where we see a lot of this happen. Uh, and Schwartz calls it, and I think this is kind of a very true statement. He says it's the most confusing discrete symmetry. And I would 100% agree with him. It's incredibly confusing. A lot of it does not, a lot of it's very hard to wrap your mind around. Um, it took me a long time working on it. I actually wrote an essay about this and how this is a big problem in physics about talking about the real time reversal symmetry that happens at the Lorenz invariant scale, which is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we'll talk about both, but then the other one that happens at the cosmic scale, which is more about just replaying the time backwards. So let's talk about them. So if we just take the time backwards, we want to describe the time reversal symmetry as something that takes our coordinates of t and x to negative t and x, right? Reverse in space makes sense. That billiard ball spinning one way and traveling one way. Reverse that in space, and what do you get? Well, it's going to spin the opposite direction and come back to you. That looks a lot like time, right? Um, we're not going to talk about all the discrete symmetries, but the two other major ones are charge and parity. And then together, charge and parity is how you actually get to this. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, charge and parity are, are, are important. All of those symmetries can be broken. We find things in nature that don't follow those symmetries. Um, but there's a symmetry that combines all three, CPT, charge, parity, and time reversal. And nothing in nature has been found to violate that. But people are still looking. <sighs> um, OK, let's see here. Uh, so we need a transformation for our spinners uh, that will uh, you know, we need a transformation that's going to accomplish this. So if we look at our Dirac spinner, so we have a Dirac field with Dirac spinners. Uh, there's going to be Lagrange components that look like this. And we're going to want to take it to the negative form of this. Okay, so this is where we're going to get a little bit more t technical and get into some more of the particle and high energy physics type of stuff. Um, but we can also simplify this. This is just the time component, right? We have the zero gamma, uh, gamma to zero, which is the time component. So we can just sort of switch this to a little bit of a simpler form. And this is what we're really looking for. We're looking for this. You know, we want to take the combination of these two fields. If we have some sort of Lagrangian term with these two fields, we want to take it to the negative version of itself. Um, now, of course, this is impossible for Dirac spinners. This is impossible uh, as a, this is impossible for a Dirac spinner, right? That just, it's not likely that this is going to happen for, or it's not possible for a Dirac spinner. Um, but we can talk about the possibilities, and there's going to be two of them. The first one that we're going to do is when we take this t to negative t directly, uh, much like we would think about playing the video backwards. And the second one is going to be, we're going to need a little bit more complicated, but first we have to figure out why we can't just do the first one, okay? So imagine that there is a transformation. So I know I said it's impossible, but just imagine it's not impossible for a second. What would it look like? Well, it would be a linear transformation, so we can have this t, uh, would take it to some gamma psi. So psi would, so the t would take some psi to some gamma psi. Oh, sorry, give me a second. 
There we go. Conjugate. And uh, then the adjoint of psi would go to gamma psi conjugate. I think this is also supposed to be adjointed. And that would turn into psi, the transpose of psi times gamma adjoint. Okay? <clears throat> so then we could talk, so this is just the two transformations of, of psi and, and psi, the adjoint of psi. So then we could talk about what that means like in a situation much like the, or we can actually look at what these examples would look like in the Lagrangian. So for example, if we find this type of term in a Lagrangian, which we see all the time in Lagrangians, this would end up going to y, or psi transpose, gamma adjoint, times gamma psi conjugate, and then we can simplify. So this stuff is not easy to simplify. You could actually do all of this. If you guys remember that one of the first YouTube videos I made was uh, fun with gamma matrices. <laughs> like this is all gamma matrix stuff. Like it's a lot of jumping up and down with gamma matrices and, and looking at what the different identities are and things like that. Um, so we can rewrite this gamma alpha beta dagger, gamma beta gamma dagger, beta little gamma, these are just dummy indices <clears throat> that happen from moving everything around. Okay, we're good. And then of course we can then cycle the psi through and pick up a minus sign. So it would look like this minus psi conjugate gamma. And then we'd get probably, I think from a fierce identity maybe, this would happen. I'm gonna not write F. Um, beta gamma transpose, yep. Alpha, or psi alpha. <laughs> gamma matrices, yeah. A lot of gamma matrices stuff. Um, <clears throat> all right, and then you can ultimately, then you can kind of kill the indices and say what this really looks like. Psi, dagger, gamma, dagger, gamma, transpose, and then psi. After we <clears throat> contract all the indices. So now, what do we get? Well, if we wanted this to be true, and we started with this, actually this is more about, you know, why, or psi dagger psi going to negative psi dagger psi. But <clears throat> conjugate just follows. Um, so then, what can we do? Well, we need then this to be equal to the identity, so we need gamma dagger gamma to be the identity. Well, what happens if that's the case? Well, then we can establish, and this is pretty much the, the crux of everything, we can establish what these commutation relationships are going to, uh, or what they're gonna in, uh, like look like, the different commutation relations. And from there, we can kind of establish what gamma is actually gonna become. So let's erase this. <clears throat> I know at a surface, this is all the mathematics just to describe some of the physics that I was talking about. Like we want to talk about what's going on at those events A and B, and in order to talk about what that happens at events A and B, we need to know what the actual things that take place at A and B are. And there's these interactions inside of the Lagrangian, right? And those interactions inside the Lagrangian is what we're actually testing to be time reversal symmetric. What's it mean to start with an interaction at A and go to an interaction at B can we express that with the same physics of starting at the interaction B and going back to the interaction A? Like that's really all this is. Now I know there's a, there's a lot of buildup to get to the mathematics here. This stuff I'm not even very confident in myself. But the idea is, is that, that's what it is. <laughs> so we're gonna start, sorry, we're gonna start with this again. Do 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 do. Okay, so we want that to be true. Uh, we want gamma to be unitary, um, so we can think we can start considering some of the kinetic energy terms of an actual Lagrangian, and we'll have our you know psi bar, psi, which is like the fields that describe the antiparticle and particle, and from there we can then 
talk about, you know, the pretty much the same thing we had last time, the transpose, pose, gamma. But now we actually have to include some gamma matrices, the lowercase gamma. I know I'm saying a lot of gammas. And this is going to be like a term that we might find in the Lagrangian after we do this time reversal uh, operation to it. <clears throat> and what happens? Well, we know that we can actually get from here to here following this if we let this have the following properties. We actually now can kind of describe these, these commutation relations between gamma and these so that we can get to this identity and get so that gammas, all the gammas are, are unitary themselves. So we can get them out of it easily by uh, having some commutation relationship between these that lets us rearrange nicely. So what are those commutation relationships? Well, we'll get an anti-commutator between gamma, capital gamma and gamma one is equal to zero. A commutation between gamma and little gamma one. I think I said, so let's try. Welcome to the channel. Ooh. Things get a little bit weird. Saying all these words. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an anti-commutation relationship between capital gamma and gamma zero. There's a commutation relation between gamma and little gamma one. Not I, because we have to go case by case. Also, welcome to the channel, Tiger Chan. Welcome, welcome. Now, uh, what else is there? Oh yeah, so there's another anti-commutation relation between gamma and capital gamma and little gamma two, the gamma two matrix, anti-commutation relation. And lastly, there's a commutation relation between gamma and little gamma three. Okay, that way we can rearrange all of these to make sure that the gammas are unitary and cancel to go to the uh, identity matrix as well as the capital gamma is going to the identity matrix as well. Okay, so we have to consider the, another term in the Lagrangian. And we're going to need all of these for this next term. So we have to consider a next term in the Lagrangian that's basically like what happens if you get a gamma inside the Lagrangian <coughs> term. And there's, those exist for sure. Oh, did I skip something? <gasps> Ooh, I think I made a mistake. I did make a mistake. I made a mistake right Welcome here. Welcome to the channel. I skipped Things down get a options. little bit weird. Sorry. There we go. Nobody called me out on this. Actually, <laughs> don't blame you. I didn't even see it. Why did I put that up there? It should be down here. And then. There we go. Okay, that's better. Now, that makes more sense. Okay. <clears throat> now we can actually talk about the other one, which you're going to see here. Now that we actually have this in here, and we can introduce this gamma zero. Uh, <clears throat> and as part of the... Capital gamma. Too many gammas. Where is it? Ah, there it is. Have to actually make sure I write down the right one this time. So now we get that introduction of gamma zero and gamma and psi. <clears throat> and then of course we can keep going. We'll end up with another, uh, let's just keep writing it down, I guess. Negative, uh, psi bar, gamma dagger, gamma zero, gamma i, and then our other gamma zero, transpose times psi. And then lastly, we get down to our final form. We're finally in the final form, capital gamma dagger, Gamma I, gamma, transpose, psi. Oops, psi. Okay, so now we can see from here to here, we know again, now we can kind of establish some more relationships. Uh, and this is how we get to these. <laughs> this one only told us the first one. This one only told us the first one. I kind of jumped the gun on the second ones. <clears throat> So this is good. We're just trying to, we're, I'm about to unveil the big, the big thing. So from this first one relationship, we could get this one right here. And then from this second relationship right here, we can find the rest of the commutation relations. And again, this is just by taking, remember, reminder, this is just because we want to take T to negative P. <clears throat> So 
So what happens when we do that? Well, it turns out the gamma gamma, wait, hold on. Is it gamma gamma or just gamma? I think it's just gamma. Gamma is equal to, you can write gamma as gamma zero, gamma two. So, uh, you know, multiplication of two matrices together. Um, and yeah, so you can write gamma is equal to gamma zero, gamma two, and that is pretty cool. Um, however, what happens? Well, I'm not going to spare you the details of the math, but this is what happens. What happens if you apply CP to, an, uh, to a, uh, a particle, right? So see, if you apply CP, so it's charge parity. So if you apply charge and parity, manipulations would require non-relativistic electron systems like for spin chains or something. Oh, I see. For the I, I got it. I got it. Uh, okay, so what happens if we just apply charge and parity to like an electron? What happens? Well, we get that for this is what that happens is we just get that same thing. We get that original idea of going from A to B, and then you apply charge parity, and that is exactly the same thing as saying B to A, but instead of uh, ooh, jeez. But instead of an electron going to an electron backwards in time, you now are getting an, uh, an antiparticle. So CP will take a particle to an antiparticle. Let's do this too. That's what CP does. CP takes a particle to an antiparticle. Okay. But we don't need that again. And it turns out if we do this, that's what we're doing. We're just doing this again. So what happens if you apply C, P, and then T? Well, if you're doing this again, you go from a particle to an antiparticle, but then back to a particle again. And what is that? Well, there's a term in the business that we like to call as trivial. H.R. Fugin, welcome, by the way. Thank you for the follow if I missed that. I must have missed that. We call that trivial. We don't want to go from a particle to an antiparticle back to a particle. We want to go to a particle to a particle backwards in time without with skipping the antiparticle. So there's this trick. Of course, everything is a trick. Okay? There's a trick that Wigner did. Can't remember the year 19, I want to say 42? 32. There's a trick that Wigner did where he said, look at, like, you don't want to take the particle and just send time backwards. What you actually want to do, and it's dealing again with more gamma matrix fun, you're gonna do all this manipulation with gamma matrices. It's really not that enjoyable. <laughs> what you really want to do is your tri time transfer should take negative time to negative time, but it can be accomplished instead by taking I to negative Your I. high school graduation year young frozen turkey. Okay, so that's what we see. Basically what we get now is if we take this i to negative i, our commutation relations all change. They literally all change. To what, you may ask? Oh, we call this, we have a term for this, it's called anti-linear. Anti-unitary, I've heard it called before, anti-linear. We're gonna go with anti-linear because that's what, uh, that's what old uh, Schwartz says. So anti-linear takes i to negative i, and then what does that mean? Well, all of our Dirac spinners get the opposite relations. So we have the now we have the commutation. This is going to be the new gamma, uh, which instead is an anti-linear operator. It is equal to the anti. Uh, Anti-symmetric form for gamma one is equal to, and again, I don't understand this stuff nearly as much as I should or could. This is a work in progress for me. This is something I'm still working on, trying to understand what this really means, what the physics of this means. To like take an I and change it to negative I and be okay with that, knowing that that gives me the right answer. So now what we get is if we take that particle, and we apply this time reversal operator, 
Instead of getting a particle with an opposite charge, now we conserve the charge and we get that billiard ball picture where we run it backwards in time. This actually goes, makes T, makes the same thing happen, right? It sends T, or it sends CPT, I should say. Uh, what is it? I guess I'll just make up notation on the fly. I think it's, I, think it's I, I wanna say. I'll have to look in a second. Is it I? Oh, we have some weird matrix stuff out front of it. But yeah, you get the picture. I think there's some weird matrix stuff out in front of it. <clears throat> but yeah, so that's what we want. We really wanna send, we end up sending, I'll just give it the I for now, just cause I'm not 100% I'm not sure about it. But we really end up sending, uh, side to side with negative P to minus.